Did you know that part of Uniquely You Summit's commitment to Black girls is to teach us a proper knowledge of self, to teach us how to self-love and self-care, also to help us discover and use our unique and diverse voices? I mean, wow, they do a lot. Part of doing that is learning that Black girls should have agency, agency over their own bodies and lives. Our next guest, Dr. Sharis and Dr. Rebecca, are here today to speak to us about how to properly advocate for, care for, have choice over, and speak up when it comes to our bodies. Dr. Rebecca Fenton earned her undergraduate degree in human biology from Stanford University before attending medical school at the University of, Pil at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She now works as an adolescent medicine fellow at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, where she has put incredible focus on the experience of black youth within the medical field. Dr. Sharish Chambers graduated magna cum laude from Spelman College with a degree in biology before completing her OBGYN residency in 2018. Dr. Sharis launched her professional social media platform, The Period Doctor, in 2018 in order to add to the lack of minority physician representation on the internet and to access and teach bodily health to communities who may have to learn it elsewhere. Check out her Instagram at The Period Doctor. Let's welcome Dr. Sharis and Dr. Rebecca. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. And we are so happy to be here. This is awesome. This is amazing. All right. Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started. So we are each going to talk to you about some of the topics that are near and dear to our heart. And then afterwards, we're going to have some space where you all can ask us two doctors who are Black girls just like you some questions about your health. So definitely get your questions ready for us. All right, so I love that the topic chosen today was Black Girl Body Love, because that's what today is absolutely all about. Um, so let's get started. First, I really wanted to be able to talk about my story. I actually recently found this picture that you see here of me at like seventh or eighth grade, and I was thinking about how did I first learn about bodies and what was the generations of knowledge that was either passed down or not passed down within my family. I remember growing up, my, mom, my grandmother told me a story about the fact that when she was about 18, um, she didn't really know much and that her mother didn't tell her much about what it meant to grow up or to be a woman or even um, what relationships were like. So she actually uh, made out with a boy on the stairs and might have felt something under his pants and ran back to her mother afraid, thinking that she'd gotten pregnant and just realizing that like for her at 18 to not know much and that information was pretty shocking for me to hear. Whereas my mom looks back and remembers and was thinking like, yeah, my grandma, my mother didn't really tell me much about like periods or about what it meant to be interested in boys later in life. But I guess I learned some stuff in school, but it wasn't really until my mom actually was in nursing school that she had an opportunity to really understand how bodies worked both in herself and in others um, and felt really empowered by that. And that's what led her to become not only a nurse, but a teacher for nurses for the last 30 years. And so then when I was growing up and looked at that age, similar to you listening to this call, my mom wanted me to make sure that I had the knowledge about my body. And so she bought me this book, The Care and Keeping of You, which looked exactly like that. And I read that cover to cover multiple times, um, wondering how the changes in my own body would look like preparing for the fact that I might have a period today, um, which we'll definitely talk about today. Um, and that actually probably was what grew my own interest in wanting to make sure that people were prepared for the process that as we grow, changes happen and those changes can often be very, very normal, but also letting people know what things to watch out for. And so I'm super happy to be able to be here today. And yet I wondered what happens when we don't talk about bodies. So when they actually asked people who were in college, 38%, so less than half of female college students could identify the vagina on a picture. That as I thought about when I talked to my patients about how many pads or tampons they're using over the course of the day, I know myself noticed a trend that it seems like black girls are using tampons less. And that's true. Only 29 percent of them versus 71 percent of white teens are using them. And the more common reasons that um, patients were reported is that their families thought that they were unsafe or inappropriate for them to use at their age. 
that when we look at sexually transmitted infections, they can be anywhere from five to 16 times higher in black youth versus white youth over the last 20 years. And the black teens also have twice the unintended pregnancy rate. And while we know that abstinence only programs do not work as far as helping people understand the right choices that they should be able to make for their bodies, they are more common in the South and that's where over half of black teens live. And while certain feminine hygiene products like pads or period cups or um, tampons are super helpful, there's a whole market that I will talk about a little bit today that are all really unnecessary products and yet they're sold to teenagers to try to make us think that we need more to be able to take care of our bodies and that industry makes $6.2 billion a year. And that's specifically one of those products. The douche is something that black women are using at higher rates than any other racial group. And when we even asked adolescents, what are they doing? We found that they were washing themselves anywhere from one to five times a day and that they were also using vaginal specific soaps, which we'll talk about are not necessary. So then I sat back and I wondered, why are we afraid to talk to black girls about their bodies? And when I thought about it, I think a part of it is that we want to protect their innocence. Unfortunately, when you ask people in a study, when you compared white girls to black girls, the reality is that black girls as young as five years old were seen as adults by um, adults who should be taking care of them and who instead of said, oh, I should go in and intervene because they're innocent, they actually felt that black girls were able to take care of stuff themselves and did not need as much protection from adults. And then also we know that black girls tend to start puberty earlier. And maybe that's a part of the reason why they're starting to be seen as adults much earlier than other girls. And with that, we know that when we look at racial groups, unfortunately black girls also have higher rates of sexual assault or unwanted sexual touch. And maybe we think that lack of information protects them, that maybe if we don't talk about these things um, by either not teaching sexual education classes or asking people to preserve themselves, that that's the best way to be able to protect them. Or maybe if we don't talk about periods, we trust that we could be able to keep them young girls as possible. And reality is we know that all of those things don't help and that if we don't talk about periods, then people are afraid. Or if we don't talk about what how bodies work and the best way to make safe sexual choices, we learn that actually the opposite happens and we see higher rates of sexual activity and um, sexually transmitted infections. And also, I think sometimes we treat girls worse than even we treat boys and we make them hold the burden of sex and teen pregnancy. We say that girls who develop early, even if it's out of their control or who date a lot of boys, we call them fast or hoes versus for boys who do the same, they're considered pimps or cool. We say that physical signs like hymen or pregnancy are used to judge girls and yet boys don't necessarily have those same signs of, oh, they've had sex in their bodies. Or we put the burden of purity and virginity on girls so that they don't stand out or get um, called those names that we just talked about. And so then when I thought back to history, I was wondering like, where did all of this come from? And I realized that even since slavery, black women have not had control over their bodies. When we think about what it looked like for slaves to be sold, they were in these very public settings where they were nude to be able to show how strong they would be and what's, how good of an investment would they would be. So it wasn't even about their person, but purely about the body and the work that they can do. So here's a picture to the left in the, of a slave, um, former slave, excuse me, who in the 1930s was standing next to an auction block that was in Virginia that has since been removed to all the um, movements that have been happening this past summer. And we think about the fact that um, slaves, uh, women who were enslaved were also um, subject to rape and that um, that was by both those who were in charge of them, but then also forcing them to be able to choose partners based off of how strong the children would be. And so they didn't have the opportunity to even choose the fathers of their children. And then when we also look back to this time, medical procedures that we use today were actually practiced on women who were enslaved without their consent or access to pain medications. And all of these terrible things were justified by basically saying, well, one, they're property, they're not people, we can do this to them. But that also black women compared to white women were just more hypersexual. And so these were all just things that they deserved as opposed to things that they should be protected from. And unfortunately these acts didn't finish in slavery. And so even in the Jim Crow era, you had that rape laws were only protecting white women and not black women that even when black women were lynched, that they also unfortunately experienced rape or even um, changes negatively to their bodies. And that also they experienced first forced sterilization, which means that basically somebody took away their right to be able to have children without their permission. And unfortunately, we even see that act continuing today, for example, in women who were, live in prisons or who are um, 
low income and certain communities. And so as I was preparing for this talk, I was reading an awesome book called When Chicken Heads Come to Roost by Joan Morgan. And she talks about this dynamic of how differently white women and black women were treated and how that continued um, to today. So talking about that kind of Jim Crow era after slavery, she says, since white women men also believed white women were too fragile for thoughts beyond beauty and motherhood, the Southern Belle, referring to white women, was considered too virtuous and pure. She was expected, however, to turn a blind eye to the illicit sexual liaisons within her darker stepsister. So while the Southern Belle was hoisted up on a pedestal so high that she was beyond the central reach of her own husband, black women were consigned to the other end of the scale as mistresses, whores, and breeders. And while those language is so harsh, I think it unfortunately demonstrates just how disrespected black women were and the patterns that unfortunately can continue today in our culture. I think it's so important for us to understand our bodies and that that knowledge is power for being able to both care for ourselves, but also being able to um, respect ourselves in future relationships. And so I have a great friend of mine who's actually also an adolescent medicine fellow, and she does education on Instagram, including being able to draw pictures. And so this is her artwork here. And I wanted to be able to talk about what on the outside would we see in our bodies as women. So that I wanted to start at the top, which we call the mons. It basically is an area of skin, sometimes covered by hair um, that we all have. And then kind of going down from there, we've got um, the clitoris, which is basically a small patch of skin that's at the front and it's covered by a hood. Um, it has a lot of nerve endings that actually continue deeper into our body. So next from there is our urethra, which is where um, pee or urine comes from. And then um, below that, we've got the larger hole, which is our vagina, and that leads towards the uterus. And I know that Dr. Charis is going to talk a little bit more about what things inside look like. Um, and other things from the outside, at the very end, we've got our anus, which is where um, stool or poop comes from. And then we also have kind of two layers that we call lips or in Latin labia. And so there's a larger layer, majora, smaller layer, menorah, and those can look in different shapes and colors and different people, but all of those varieties are normal. And so while often we call this, you'll hear in culture, people call this whole area vagina, the reality of vagina is actually specifically just this hole, but we actually refer to the outside area as the vulva. And then also I just wanted to mention, because sometimes people have heard this word, hymen is basically a thin layer of tissue, which can sometimes be around the vaginal open. It can come in different shapes. And again, all of those varieties are normal. Um, and sometimes even just being a, a physically active person can lead to those having changes even before anybody has ever had any type of sexual activity. And I think another thing that my patients worry about is noticing when they see something that looks like discharge or in their underwear and wondering whether or not that's normal. And yes, it is a normal body function. And in fact, that fluid has healthy bacteria, which I know sometimes we think of bacteria always as a bad thing. And so we're like, can bacteria ever be healthy? But yes, we have healthy bacteria all over our skin and our gut. And we also have that within our vagina. And that that's actually what keeps the vagina clean and moist. And those are both normal and perfect activities that um, should be our body does on its own. And then actually even drinking lots of water can even make that discharge less thick if that's ever something that we're worried about. But basically, the key thing is to be able to learn what your normal is and realize that everybody is different. And so your pattern of what discharge may look like or smell like may be a little different than others. But I wanted to talk about a little bit what does that healthy discharge look like versus those who when you should be a little bit concerned about it and maybe get things checked out. So healthy vaginal discharge can be clear or whitish in color, it can have a slight odor that isn't strong smelling. It can have a yellowish tint on your underwear. And so I know that I've seen some videos on TikTok of people being surprised that they can notice that it almost kind of stains or bleaches the underwear, that that's a normal function of it as well. And that it can change in consistency throughout our menstrual cycle or when we're having periods. And so there might be times where it may be a little more thin, other times where it's a little more thick and almost stringy. And those differences are also all normal. But then I wanted to talk a little bit about what to watch out for. So basically, once you've noticed, hey, OK, this is kind of my usual pattern. If you notice that there's a change where there's a stronger odor, where there's a difference in the color, where the consistency or how it feels or looks feels different, or the amount where you're noticing that there's a lot more than usual, those would all be things to look out for. And then there's possible reasons for those changes. One of those can just be hygiene or how you're cleaning yourself. So sweat and bacteria can build up in dark, small places. And that is one of the, our vulva is one of those areas. And that can cause odor and irritation if we're not cleaning it properly. And we'll talk a little bit later about how to do that. A bacteria imbalance where now we're kind of shifting the amount of bacteria can be something that can cause an, um, a change in our discharge. So one of those things we talk about, like a yeast infection, could be a thick white discharge that comes with itching and burning. 
or what we call bacterial vaginosis, which is a thin white or gray discharge that has a pretty strong and different order, odor than our normal. And even when we might see different colors like yellow, green or gray or pink discharge, those should be all things that make us wonder if there's an infection going on. And so we definitely recommend talking with your healthcare provider. Sometimes patients are like, I'm not sure if this is normal and I'm happy always to answer those questions. And many times it is, but we wanna make sure that we're evaluating if it's a change. So how do we stay fresh and clean, especially in that sensitive area of our body? So in the shower or bath, we wash the mons, which again was kind of that top part section with warm water and a mild or unscented soap so that we're not irritating it. And then we should separate the labia to make sure that water gets cleaned around the clitoral hood and or between the labia to rinse off any secretions that just may naturally develop in those areas. But the key thing is that we are not putting any soap or any cleaning products actually inside the vagina, which again is the hole that leads up to the uterus. We're rinsing that area completely. We're patting it dry with a soft towel. We're wearing cotton underwear during the day. And you could even actually take a break from underwear under your pajama pants at, um, at night just to be able to allow things to air out. And then always when we're in the bathroom, we're wiping from front to back because again, the um, rectum has normal bacteria, but we don't want that to be causing an infection within our vulva. And then as I was um, something that comes up a lot for patients is there's just so many products on the market that are telling us that these are things that we need to be able to buy, to be clean, to smell fresh. And then the truth is everything that I just described is all that you need to do. Um, so one of the products I saw was on this left side called OMV that's on TikTok. Vagisil is a um, company that's been around for a long time trying to sell vaginal specific products. And they actually created one specifically for teenagers. But then they described that everything is this vanilla clementine scent. And they described that basically the goal of it was to make sure that it's your smell sweet, kind of fruity and totally delish. And I was really just sitting there being like, who needs to smell delicious? This is your body. This is your vulva. This is all normal. Um, and on the other side, there's an organization called Honey Pot. And what I love about it is that it's run by Black women. But what I don't like is this idea that, again, you need special products and that specific Specifically, while they're marketing all of these products as natural, they're still essential oils, and therefore there's still scents in them that have the potential of being very irritating for people. And so even though the website describes no itching, no burning, no worries, girl, in reality for some people, even in the sensitive products, these scents like lavender, grapefruit, um, and apple cider vinegar um, can actually cause some irritation. And so here's a long list of the things that you should watch out for just to make sure that you have a healthy vulva. So any products with perfume or scents can be irritating. Um, bath or essential oils, as much as I love a good bubble bath, I really take sure not to use things that would be irritating, especially when you're sitting in them for a while. The bubble bath liquid or bath bombs as well, especially if you see them frequently, can be irritating because of the scents in them. So actually the thing that I use instead is I just pour a little bit of my body wash in the water as I'm um, doing a bath, which gives it some bubbles, but without necessarily the same um, concern for irritation. Um, any kind of deodorant sprays in your um, vulva area are not necessary. We talked about douches or any vaginal cleaning product, anything that's intended to go within the vagina should not be used. Even things like a feminine wash or a wipe, especially those wipes can be quite drying. Um, panty liners are great if you're bleeding just a little bit, but using them every day, similarly, you could imagine like within that wipe, sorry, within that panty liner, there can be um, sweat and you're like moist and it just is unfortunately a great place for bacteria to grow. I've heard of patients using the pH balance pills as ways to be able to try to help their vaginal health. And the reality is your body does a great job of balancing itself. Um, probiotics, although they're great for our gut, um, have not really been shown to be able to prevent some of the infections that we talked about. So they're not necessary. Using any other kind of material in underwear, silk, lace, or synthetic, we really want to make sure that there's a cotton square over where your vulva is covered, and that's because that's going to be the only breathable fabric. Wearing tight foot fitting clothing all the time, like I know athletes are always in their shorts or in their uh, leggings and making sure that you're giving yourself a break from those as well. And even thongs, wearing them all the time, realizing that basically, unfortunately, when things um, are askew, that basically they could kind of move back and forth and put bacteria where we don't want it to be. And some people may also be sensitive to laundry detergent fragrances, fabric softeners, or even hot showers or bath can be very drying to your skin, especially if you're not putting on moisturizer afterwards. So I loved this quote from one of the ob guy and doctors or um, who I follow on TikTok, who is saying, your vagina is introvert, leave it alone, please. And I think that's such a great summary for today. 
So where do we learn more? Um, again, we'll have a time for questions at the end of today, but also I wanted to talk about the fact that every adolescent should have a private time to talk with their provider. And that this actually is one of my favorite times of when I get to see patients because I get a chance to learn about what's going on in their lives beyond the medical reason they came to see me. So during that private time, we get a chance to discuss your health, including school, family, friends, and all your feelings. And it's also a chance for you to ask questions, no matter how silly or embarrassing they may feel. I've heard some all kinds of things, and I definitely am always still wanting to give all of my teen patients their answers. And then in general, knowing where to go for information, because there is so much online, there's so much that we hear our friends say, we want to make sure that we're always getting good sources. So talking to um, parents or guardians or other people that we trust about information. One of the websites I love is Young Women's Health, which is created specifically and just for adolescent girls and provides great information that's written by doctors and other providers like myself, and also um, trusted doctors on social media. And so the period doctor who's about to speak next is one of those great examples of somebody who makes sure that you're getting the information that you need and the um, correct questions and that you can trust. So thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions a little later in the program. And I love the topic here, Black Girl Body Love. This is super important. This is what I want every patient to kind of uh, experience after you know, speaking with me or after their visit or something. If I could it really get every Black girl to feel this way about themselves, about their bodies, I think that would be amazing. As I mentioned before, I'm an OBGYN, but I did a, a subspecialty fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology. It's super fun. And then, of course, you can follow me at the period, doctor. Um, so we'll advance to the next slide. So we kind of touched on this. I think the only thing I forgot is that I am the third OBGYN in my family, which is just an aside. My dad is an OBGYN and so is my brother, which is super random. <laughs> uh, they still deliver and do all of the general OBGYN things, but I focused on 21 and under. And so now I'm just operating in my subspecialty. So now I just want to talk about the introduction of female anatomy. And I'm going to talk about the internal anatomy since um, Dr. Rebecca really already touched on the outside anatomy uh, so thoroughly. Next. So what's super important to, to gather about anatomy is kind of correlating things. And so we talked about the external anatomy, which we have, you know, at the very top, our urethra, uh, the vagina is in the middle, and then where you poop from the anus is in the back, you know, which is why we wipe front to back, just like Dr. Fenton said. Um, but I want to talk more about the specific reproductive structures when you go above the vagina. And so the picture to the far left has the vagina at the base, and then it leads to the cervix. So the cervix is that part of uh, the uterus. It's like the neck of the uterus. It's, it bridges the vagina to the uterus. It's the part of the body that has to open to 10 centimeters to allow the baby to be born. And so a lot of people kind of, you reference that, it'll be on Gray's Anatomy, like, oh, she's almost 10 centimeters or whatever. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about the vagina. They're not talking about the uterus. They're not talking about the baby itself. It is the cervix, which is the neck of the uterus or the doorway to the uterus, opening up enough for the baby to actually exit, which means that the uterus must be where the baby is. So the uterus is a muscle. It's kind of low in the pelvis, and it's a muscle where your period comes from and where a baby would reside during pregnancy. Um, it's a muscle, so it cramps and it contracts like all of your other muscles, you know, and that's what it does. Uh, so a lot of folks kind of have that misconception that babies are in the stomach. No, they're definitely not in the stomach. I can tell you that 100%. And that's just because food goes in your stomach. There's a bunch of acid in your stomach. That's not where a baby would be born. And there's no connection from your stomach to the vagina. There's a connect connection from the vagina to the uterus, which makes a lot of sense. On um, the inside of the uterus is the uterine lining. And that is what changes throughout the month based on your hormones. Your hormones cause it to get nice and thick. And it causes it to kind of shed, which is what causes a period to occur. On both sides of the uterus are the fallopian tubes. Their sole job is to pick up the eggs from the ovaries and take it into the uterus, which means that the ovaries must hold all of the eggs. And so everyone that's born female is born with all of the eggs that they will ever have. You're not making new eggs throughout your life. They're all there and they're slowly released on a almost monthly basis called ovulation. When they're released, those like finger-like projections of the fallopian tube actually kind of pick the egg up and slowly work it into the uterus. That is why when you hear people say that they got their tubes tied, getting your tubes tied just means that your tubes are somewhat either removed 
burned, cut some way to prevent that passageway from happening. Because if the ovary cannot release eggs into the uterus, then you're not able to get pregnant. And so that's a form of, you know, a permanent sterilization, which can be done for someone who has completed or reached their fertility potential or their desired um, number of children. And so that's super, super important to know just about your basic anatomy. Another thing that's important that's not quite on the slide is your uterus is roughly about the size of your fist. So it's not very big. So if you just look at your fist, kind of this length here, that would be the size of your uterus. And then the uterus is low in the pelvis. And I think that's shown very well on the picture on the far right, where you can kind of see the bladder, which is this circular structure in the front that leads to the urethra where you pee from. That makes sense. The urine is stored in your bladder. The vagina is just after that, and that leads up to the uterus, which makes sense. Your period comes out of the vagina. And then just beyond that, the anus, which leads up to the rectum and the colon, because that's where you poop from. And so all of that makes sense. And you can kind of understand how, you know, maybe when you're on your period, you have different kind of bowel movements. You have a little bit more frequency of pooping. It, they're right next to each other. And so sometimes uh, the symptoms and changes kind of affect things a little bit closely. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Next. So this is just another, I will never get tired of saying this. There's an external, there's an internal. Dr. Fenton explained it beautifully, but I think this is something that is very important, especially for parents teaching their daughters. Know the difference, vagina is inside, okay? Next. So let's talk briefly about hormones. I think it's really important to understand hormones. Most of us just understand that they're blamed for a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, and if you're kind of being crazy one day, you're like, I'm sorry, it's my hormones. <laughs> so I, I think we, we blame hormones for a lot of things, but they're super important. So if you talk about estrogen and progesterone, those are the important hormones, chemical messengers um, of women or, or people who are born female. And so they, they are pr predominantly formed in the ovaries. And estrogen is what thickens the uterine lining. It's also what causes breasts to grow at the earlier part of puberty. Uh, so a lot of the changes that occur in the body actually occur because of estrogen and that increased um, kind of level of estrogen. Um, progesterone is another really important hormone. And in, when it's kind of present right after estrogen is present and then drops off, that's what causes you to have um, a period. So, so that's actually wonderful too. And then if we can hit next, there's one more hormone I want to talk about. Testosterone. So testosterone is super interesting. A lot of um, people think this is a male hormone and that's not incorrect, but women have a certain amount of testosterone too. It's typically at a lower level when compared to um, the level in men. But if you do have elevated levels of testosterone, that can throw off your period because they all kind of interact together. Um, elevated testosterone can lead to things like more acne on the face, um, infrequent periods, more hair on the face or more hair on the body. And so it's one of those things that we check. We always check hormonal levels if we think that there's an issue with the frequency of your periods. Uh, and, and they can give you a lot of insight, but they're super, super important and not just those things that we blame for bad days. Next. Okay, next. So I do want to talk about the period. Again, uh, when you look at the uterus, of course, you have that muscle part, and that's not what comes out during a period. It's the lining of the uterus that actually thickens and then kind of comes off or, or, or sheds. And that is the whole point of a period. I like this slide because it kind of shows um, a little bit of the blood kind of coming out through the vagina. And when you think about the blood of a period, there's only so much that you can do with that blood. And a lot of women are focused on how we manage our periods. And as Dr. Fenton mentioned, you know, a lot of um, black girls in particular are not comfortable using tampons. And it's not that any, you know, someone has to use a tampon. No, that's not it at all. But when it comes to managing your period and the flow, you can really only hold the blood or absorb it. There's not a lot of other ways to get rid of it. Um, and so, what a tampon is, is the absorbing of the blood within the vagina while a pad absorbs it on the outside. A um, menstrual disc or menstrual cup just holds it on the inside. It's really not super complicated. And once you know that, then you can just decide which is best for you. Next. <laughs> That's my little cute panty liner that flies into the picture unnecessarily. Okay, so this is my favorite way to explain um, the menstrual cycle to uh, teenagers and moms and, and really anybody. Uh, and it's it's one of those things where I truly believe um, that 
you know, everyone should know this, not just people who have periods, not just menstruators, but the people that love them, the people that seek to understand them, the people that support them throughout their life. You know, that's fathers, that's brothers, that's boyfriends, that's girlfriends, that's all of those people. Because when you understand it more, it just makes more sense and you can support people better. And then you understand all of the decisions around periods and pregnancy and all of that. And so I'm going to go through this slide, but this is a really, really important slide. So hopefully you guys are able to um, ask questions if you don't understand. And I'd love to, you know, really try to get drive this home, if you will. So when you talk about the menstrual cycle, it's a circle, right? So there's no real start point in particular, but you have to choose somewhere to start. So we're just gonna say, we're gonna start at the very end of the period. So let's say we've had the period, it just stopped, and now the lining is beginning to thicken again. When the period ends, the estrogen at the end of your period is very low. The brain actually releases a hormone, it's called follicle stimulating hormone, and that talks to the ovaries, and then the ovaries start to increase a follicle, which increases the level of estrogen. As estrogen increases, the lining increases, and that's called the proliferative phase. It's just that the lining of the uterus is getting thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. Your brain also releases another hormone, luteinizing hormone, which is this nice guy that's like slapping this follicle, and that leads to release of the egg. Release of the egg is ovulation. This is super important for women that are trying to get pregnant. They wanna know if they have ovulated. So they use things called ovulation predictor kits and things like that. And they test their hormones and their temperature and all of those things. It's known that your temperature changes slightly around ovulation. The cervical mucus and your discharge changes a little bit around ovulation. Uh, and then this level, this luteinizing hormone level is going to be super high during ovulation. And so ovulation predictor kits just have you urinate or pee on a stick and it tests for that LH level. And so if it's super high, it's like, oh, you likely ovulated. This is the time in which you are fertile. And so by understanding the way our body works, we understand how to maximize our potential to get pregnant or prevent pregnancy, which is another thing. Uh, with contraception or birth control, we often prevent ovulation. Again, if that egg is not released, you're not going to be able to get pregnant. And that's the whole point. So after that egg is released, your body switches over to progesterone dominance. Progesterone that other hormone that I introduced earlier. It hangs around like, hey, are we going to get pregnant? What's happening? What's happening with this egg? When pregnancy doesn't occur, progesterone goes away like, okay, it didn't happen. And that causes the lining to shed. That's what a period is. It is your body's preparation for pregnancy, releasing of an egg, waiting around to see if pregnancy will occur. And then the lining sheds. That's it. Not super complicated when you really think about it, but it really kind of gives you a little bit of insight into all the things that have to be perfect for someone to get pregnant. OK, all of the things that have to go well for your cycles to be normal. And so understanding your cycles really gives you a, a little peek inside of what your brain is doing, what your ovaries are doing, what your uterus is doing. And so understanding cycles can be, I mean, critical to understanding you. OK, so next. So here are some period facts that I think are super important. This word menarche is the very first period that a person has. And that usually happens about two years after breast development starts. Now that's not perfect. It doesn't mean if you start you know, breast development on your 10th birthday, on your 12th birthday, you're gonna start your period. No, your body's not that good, but that's an average amount of time. So it could be a year and a half, it could be two and a half years. But the idea is that you would start to have breast development before you start your period because breast development is one of those signs of estrogen's presence. Estrogen has to be around to thicken the lining for you to start to have a period. And so that makes sense. The average age of first period, very first period is 12 and a half years. That's slightly earlier in African-American girls, and we don't exactly know why. A normal period in the adolescent lasts seven days or less. I've met girls and they're like, oh, I bleed for 10 days. That's too long. It really is. And, and it's not too long as in, you know, we just don't like the number. It's too long if you continue to bleed because it could set you up to be anemic. And so that's really the, the major issue when it comes to prolonged or excessive bleeding. And anemia is just not having enough of your red blood cells around to really get oxygen everywhere in your body. Your red blood cells carry oxygen to your brain, to all of your major organs. And when there's not enough around, you can feel lightheaded. You know, tired. You can have headaches. You can, you know, it just makes you feel pretty crummy. And then it makes your heart work a little bit too hard. And so we try to, to avoid anemia if at all possible. And that's why I think it's important for young girls, especially young black girls, to know when their period is too long. Even if your mother says, oh, my family, you know, we all have nine day periods. It's longer than 95% of people with periods and it is worth talking to a doctor about.
okay? Periods should occur every 21 to 45 days. And so that averages out to being about every month or so. Uh, and when we say occurring every 21 to 45 days, what I want for people to understand is you count from day one of bleeding of a period to day one of bleeding of the next period, not just the days that you don't bleed. No, it's a full cycle. And so we start from day one of that period of bleeding. And then we say, when is the next time that I start day one of bleeding? That is the length of your cycle. OK, that should be every 21 to 45 days. The first two to three years after you have your first period can be super irregular. OK, and that's just because I told you, you've got your brain. It's got to talk to your ovaries, got to talk to your uterus. All of that has to get together. OK, and it takes a while for that to mature or really get in sync. It doesn't mean that we just let anything go, though. You can't let anything go in the first two to three years because if you're bleeding too much, you could get really sick. And so those are the things that we actually pay attention to. So it doesn't mean just because you're within two to three years that you don't see a doctor to talk about your period. You still can. And then again, we manage bleeding with a number of different things. We got period underwear that just absorbs it, which is pretty amazing because it doesn't shift quite like pads. We've got, of course, our typical pads. We've got reusable pads, tampons, menstrual discs, menstrual cups. There's so many things. So you should really use what makes you happiest, what works best for your life. Next. So interesting period hygiene or important period hygiene. Want to wash your hands before you insert a tampon, menstrual hook or menstrual disc and wash them afterwards. I mean, that's the whole point. There's a lot of hand washing because of COVID, but there's other reasons, you know, to wash your hands, especially if they're visibly soiled. You do want to change tampons every four to six hours roughly to avoid a serious infection called toxic shock syndrome. And so a lot of folks kind of reference that as to why they don't use tampons. So I want to give a little bit of history on toxic shock syndrome. This was something that became more popular in the 1980s when there was a specific tampon created called the Rely tampon. It was a super weird thing that was supposed to be super absorbent and was meant to be used to last the entire period. As in all five to seven days, you wear that same tampon. It's very odd and it screams to me that it was made by a man. Anyway, <laughs> they started to have a lot of outbreaks of rashes and severe illness in, in reproductive age women. Uh, this happened more so in the 1980s. They connected it to tampon use and specifically use of that tampon. That tampon was removed from the market. They changed the way tampons were made entirely and changed their absorbency and clearly labeled the absorbency. And so the teaching is, if you're going to use tampons, use the tampon that is appropriate for your, your level of flow. So if you need a light tampon, don't put in you know, the super tampon. They don't make the super absorbency that we're referencing, even though they have super as a level of absorbency. And then don't leave your tampon in longer than six hours which for teenagers, especially or adolescents, my goodness, don't sleep in them because y'all can sleep for a whole day if you put your mind to it. So the idea is if you really want to be safe from a tampon use thing, change it every four to six hours, use the tampon that is right for your flow uh, and is the right size that's comfortable and then don't sleep in your tampons for that same reason. The actual risk of um, toxic shock syndrome is one in 100,000. So it's exceptionally rare, but it's still something to know about because it is a possibility. Next. Okay, abnormal periods, again, if you're bleeding longer than seven days, if the pain is so severe that you're missing school or work, if you're changing your menstrual product every hour for more than two hours, if you feel short of breath, lightheaded, dizzy on your period, those things are signs of anemia and are concerning. If you start your period before the age of nine or after the age of 16, or if you don't have any bleeding for longer than 45 days, all of those things would be suggestive of some sort of abnormality and would warrant medical evaluation. Next. So let's talk about these menstruation myths really quickly. Myth, periods are a cleansing process. I told you, it's not necessarily a cleansing process. It's just preparation for pregnancy. It doesn't happen. It gets shut off. It's not cleansing like, you know, your kidneys are cleansing, you know, your body. Your liver has some cleansing capabilities. It's not that level of cleansing and filtration. You're not dirty if you don't have your period and you're not cleaner after your period. It's just a normal process that occurs in a cyclical fashion, but it's not a true cleansing process. Um, other myth, if periods are natural, they can't be harmful. And I always reference this. Have you heard of natural disasters? Like there's actual disasters that occur naturally. And so, yes, your period is natural, but it doesn't mean that a natural occurrence could not be bad for your body if it gets too extreme or becomes too abnormal. Another myth, uh, being too mature or thinking about sex can cause you to start your periods at a younger age. 
Absolutely not. I told you that is not the case. Your periods start when it, they want to start. Typically something in the brain kind of releasing a pulsatile um, wave of a hormone that talks to your ovaries. It starts to increase the production of estrogen. It is not you thinking about a boy or being bad or being fast or any of those things uh, that people have said. You cannot use tampons until you're sexually active. False. Total myth. Dr. Fenton touched on this. She showed you, you know, there's a hymen there. All of that's supposed to be open. It doesn't magically open. It's not supposed to be broken or anything like that. And tampons don't break your hymen. Uh, so those are kind of myths that are actually shared or have a little bit of crossover there. Um, another myth, periods are supposed to be painful. No, not necessarily. There should be some associated cramping, but they're not supposed to be some torturous pain um, that prevents you from doing the things you need to do. If your period prevents you from going to work, from going to school, debilitates you, talk to someone. That could be abnormal. It could be a sign of an issue like endometriosis, which is a serious and chronic condition that we want to diagnose earlier than later. Another myth, taking birth control for period issues makes you infertile. No, of course, it's birth control in the moment. So it's going to prevent pregnancy while you're taking it. But if you stop taking those birth control pills, you can get pregnant the next day. OK, I mean, you really can. And that's why you have to take it daily. That's the whole point. The birth control of today is actually well studied. They did a study for people who took birth control pills compared to people that didn't take birth control pills to see how long it took them to get pregnant. And it was about the same in a year. And so we actually studied that to make sure that it doesn't cause infertility. Additionally, doctors whose whole job is to get people pregnant, the fertility doctors use use birth controls to control pills to prep their patients for some fertility treatments. And so they wouldn't use that if it would make them infertile. And then how to address period concerns. So if you have period concerns, and that's pain, irregularity, heavy flow, all of those things, discuss this with your parent or guardian so they can arrange for you to see a qualified healthcare provider. You can see your primary care physician, a pediatrician, an adolescent medicine uh, specialist is awesome, an adult gynecologist. Of course, I'm like, pediatric gynecologist um, could be a really good way to go, too, just because they're used to dealing with menstrual issues. Anyone that focuses on adolescents are going to probably feel more comfortable in this land than maybe someone that sees a wider group of people from, you know, zero to 70 or something like that. <laughs> Next. Okay, and then the, I get this question all the time. When should you start seeing a gynecologist? The recommendation is actually to start between the ages of 13 to 15. And that's based on the fact that most girls will have gotten their periods by then. And you can check in and understand what is a normal period? Am I having issues? All of those things. You do not have to be sexually active to see a gynecologist. Absolutely not. And then a visit can include an external exam. Um, we can do blood tests to check out your hormones and sometimes even imaging studies. Um, to look at the shape of your uterus and look at your ovaries, make sure you don't have cysts, things like that to evaluate the complaints. And yes, some issues with your periods are going to resolve on their own, but some of them may need medication or even a procedure. And I really want to drive this home. You do not need a pap smear until you are 21, regardless of sexual activity. That is something, and it's not wrong when adults think this. This was something historically that was, okay, you would need a pap smear within three years of sexual activity or by age 21. That has completely changed. It's only age 21, unless you have some a serious immune system issue that makes you immune compromised, then you would be the, the rare exception to get it earlier. But otherwise, if you're an average risk young girl, you do not need a pap smear until you are 21 years of age. Next. And I think we're up to questions. All right. Um, that our first one, is your discharge supposed to change color based on how much water you drink? It shouldn't change color. It, you can have variety kind of anywhere from like slightly white to clear that is all normal and can change over the course of your month. It might become thinner if you're drinking more water versus if you're really dehydrated. We totally shouldn't agree. see so much totally color agree. change because of that. Let's see. Um, there's another question that says, wait, do you have to go to a gynecologist? No, you don't have to go to a gynecologist at all. Um, the recommendation is to touch base with a gynecologist or at least someone that can talk to you about your periods around the age of 13 to 15. But no, you don't have to go to a gynecologist. Um, and no one's going to be sad or anything uh, if you don't. Oh, can you expound on why Black girls tend to start their cycles early? We actually don't know why this is occurring. It's kind of one of those things that we've seen from a trending standpoint. And it's about a six month earlier kind of um, pubertal development kind of process, but we don't have a lot of good information as to why. It's not necessarily a dietary thing, you know, GMOs, all those things that we think of like conspiracy related type things. Uh, we don't know, unfortunately. 
Yeah, I was just going to add that it's always so easy sometimes in medicine right. for us to just say, oh, there's a difference. And oh, just black girls do this. And I think this past summer has made medicine sometimes realize that we should probably start them. asking those questions. So people are exactly we're just starting to yeah. focus on it. We don't have those answers. How does, oh, sure. <laughs> You want to take this one? I'll tell you that you're prego. That is such a lovely <laughs> question. So when you actually become pregnant after ovulation, instead of that little kind of progesterone character just releasing progesterone, it starts to release something called HCG, uh, which is a type of hormone that we measure uh, to see if you're pregnant. You can measure it in the blood, and it actually shows up in your in your urine as well. And so that's why a urine pregnancy test works. But it doesn't work immediately because that, that actual amount of hormone has to increase. So it typically isn't detectable until about two weeks after your missed period at the very earliest. So often most people find out they're pregnant around four to six weeks at the very earliest. So that's how. Does discharge ever stop? It shouldn't mm -hmm. as long as you've got estrogen around your system, basically as long as until you're kind of what we talk about menopause, which is when those hormones that we just talked about are starting to go away. That tends to be where people may not necessarily notice the same patterns of discharge, but anybody in the age group we're talking to should have discharge. Again, it might vary over the course of the month, but it's always a good thing to be able to have discharge because basically that's what's keeping the vagina clean. And it's also what's preventing drying of that skin, which is otherwise very um, uh, fragile and gentle. <laughs> Oh, the best remedy for really bad cramps. So uh, it kind of depends. I often think of anti-inflammatories. And the reason I say that is because the uterine lining actually releases inflammatory markers during your period as a normal process, which is why we have menstrual cramps. So that all makes sense, which is why an anti-inflammatory would be the most targeted medication. Having said that, some people get relief from Tylenol and then you can use other, you know, non-medical things like a heating pad. Love a heating pad. And then the thing I always say that people will look at me like I'm crazy, work out, literally working out and just being active, that decreases cramps too. I will never forget when I started my period the first day of cheerleading camp and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like I'm not going to make all America. And it was the best period I'd ever had. Like I had almost no cramps because I was so active, physically active, releasing all these endorphins and actually um, combating um, the inflammatory markers that are released. And then if that isn't working for you, sometimes you do need hormonal medication. And that tends to be birth control medication only because that's what the hormones are. You know, we can use birth control for a number of things. Treatment of acne, heavy periods, period pain, period headaches, uh, PMS, all of those things that aren't contraception related. It just happens to work for that, too. Like you can take Benadryl for an allergy um, or because you need to try sleep on a plane or Tylenol for a fever because you have headaches. So you use things for different reasons. I just want to add real quickly that um, I don't love Midol, and that's mainly just because we can't tell what's in it. Like there are every time Midol has different kind of combinations. Some have caffeine, some have Tylenol. So I really do recommend if you're going to use an anti-inflammatory, have it be something like Advil, which is short acting, or naproxen, yeah. long acting, because then you know what the ingredients are. Love that. Love that. So who can black girls go with questions about their period and body and their family isn't safe? That mm -hmm. is a great question. I would say that I, I would, um, one is if through school, you potentially have like a science teacher, um, usually the menstrual cycle is something that should be covered in class. That can be somewhere just to get a general answer. Also, um, we do recommend that every adolescent is having like a regular well visit. And so if you're doing your school physical, that provider should be able to give you an opportunity to talk by themselves, or you can actually while they're in the visit say, hey, I'm wondering if this is normal about my period and that they should be able to give you an opportunity to be able to ask those questions confidentially and provide you um, some treatment options if necessary. I totally agree. I totally agree. How do you know the tampon is up too far? Okay. Well, when we think about the vagina, and I think it's super important for people to kind of understand this, the vagina actually is not an endless space. Like it's, it's really just, it's like a little, you know, tunnel. It's a cavity that has an endpoint. The top of it is the cervix. I assure you, you cannot put a tampon in your cervix. The cervical opening is far too small and just, it's just impossible to do for anyone who, you just literally nobody can do that. Um, and so when you say the tampon is up too far, the recommendation when you're inserting a tampon is to insert it from tip of the tampon to the grip of the tampon, because that's where the absorbent area is. The majority of vaginas are about two to three centimeters longer than a tampon. And so it shouldn't be up 
too far if you utilize those measures. And that's why tampons have those measurements. And then you just insert it per usual. But it's not going to be up too far in a sense because the vaginal length varies. And as long as it's in the vagina, it should be working as in it should be absorbing the blood that comes from the uterus, which is above. Yep, you all want to make sure at least you've got your string so that you can be able to pull yeah. that out. But sometimes that migrates and it goes up. And if that's the case, you can also still safely um, insert your finger to the vagina to be able to pull that out. Which so should you be afraid of your period? I think it is an understandable reaction. Um, and I, I remember reading my book and also being afraid of like, what does this mean when this happens? So I think hopefully what makes things less scary is one, knowing that it's going to happen, knowing that it's normal, that everybody with a uterus, as long as things are working normally, has a period. And two, preparing. So what my family did is we created a little pack that had some pads. It had an extra pair of underwear and I carried that with me everywhere. I had it in my backpack. I had one in my bedroom so that I knew that my period could come at any time but if it did, that I was ready. Um, and then two, I like letting somebody know when it happened. So I remember the day that my period started and I immediately told my mom and she kind of sat down with me. We reviewed all the things to do to take care of me and also going to um, the store to make sure that I had all the products that I needed. And so I think just having the conversations can make it a lot less scary. But anytime something's new, it feels a little scary. And I think that's OK, too. Totally agree. And that's my hope. I hope that you won't be afraid of it, but totally understand the sentiment. Uh, and, and people are afraid of things that they don't understand. And so by virtue of being here today, you have gained a little bit more understanding. And so I hope you'll you'll fear it less. How do you reduce the smell like a fishier smell? And so it kind of depends on what the cause is. Sometimes the cause of that is something called bacterial vaginosis, which is really um, a change in the levels of bacteria in the vagina, where that good bacteria that keeps things nice and acidic has, has kind of decreased. And maybe that other bacteria that's not so great has kind of overgrown a little bit. And a lot of the times you do need to talk to your physician and get um, medication. It's an antibiotic that regulates things and kind of, kind of resets things. Um, but otherwise, uh, if it's just an odor that isn't bacterial vaginosis, the cause and, and the ways to kind of reset that can be variable. I think the best thing to do is to talk to your doctor so they can evaluate to see what's causing it and then you can treat it the best way. What do you think, Dr. Fenton? Yeah, no, I would add, I think sometimes it's really just being able to figure out, is that like a normal smell for you yeah. and getting used to that? Because I think um, if you look at social media, you would think we all need to smell like pineapples and right. one, those things don't work, but also that's not natural. And so being able to learn and um, about our own body types. Okay, the next question is what is a pap smear, which is a great question. So first that starts off with what we call a speculum. I wish I had an example of it here, but basically it is a plastic device that we put through the vagina. So we talked about already that the vagina is kind of a cavity like here and all the way at the top is a little donut that kind of looks like this, sorry, my light. That's basically your cervix. And there's a tiny hole through there that allows us to be able to go through the uterus. What we know is that there's a form of cancer called cervical cancer where the cells within this area start growing abnormally. And we wanna be able to watch for that. And there's a specific virus, HPV, that causes those changes in those cells. So one, at all of your ages, we recommend getting the HPV vaccine. That could either be, depending on your age, two or three shots to make sure that you're reducing your risk of that. But then once we start at 21, we want to make sure that we're sampling those cells. And as long as they look normal, then we only do that every often, every so often. But if they're abnormal, then we want to follow that more closely and make sure that we're not missing cancer there. Perfect. What she said. Uh, next, is it normal to have more than one cramp per cycle? Now, I do not know people that are specifically counting the cramps themselves, but they often come in multiples. What is abnormal about periods or period cramps, rather, is if they are so bad that you can't do your daily you know, work, go to school, go to work, all those things. Um, and if they increase throughout your period, the general teaching is the normal cramps of periods are actually going to be worse at the beginning and then get better each day. And that's just because they should be due to those that release of the inflammatory markers. It's going to start off earlier and then kind of dissipate. If your period pain worsens, is consistent throughout every single day and never gets better or occurs after your period, that's when we think that, that cramping is abnormal. But it, in theory, to answer your question, yes, it would be normal to have more than one cramp because there's a kind of a series of muscle cramping um, that tends to occur. So next question is how old is too old to not have your period yet? So I would say if it's been two years since you've noticed that you had breast development and you've not had a period, or if you're 16 years old and you've not had a period, both of those should be reasons to be go to see a doctor, whether that be an adolescent specialist like the both of us, or at least starting with your pediatrician or family medicine doctor, and either if they're comfortable or getting a referral to be able to talk to us and do some testing. 
How should you deal with dryness in the vulva after showers? Uh, is it soap or maybe, maybe something else? else? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll let you touch on this because you talked about the vulva. Uh, yeah, so I would say that a key part is one, making sure that you're not actually using any soap in that area. It really does. I mean, other than the kind of the part where there's hair at the top, the actual below and the labia should necessarily use soap. Soap is actually, while it cleans, yes, it's also quite drying. And really, what you need is more of just a water rinse to make sure that any secretions or um, sweat that's been accumulated in that area is gone. Two, I would say that making sure that you are also like um, just pat drying as opposed to rub drying can also be pretty irritating and pretty drying. And then I would say like. Um, at most just in kind of the mons area up at the top you may if you notice dryness up there might use lotion but anything lower than that as far as like closer towards the vagina and the labia does not need anything in that area to be able to make sure that it's not dry totally agree uh, okay i've heard that periods when you first start first three years that it'll be a little inconsistent is that true if show how inconsistent so yes that is true and that's just because there's a lot going on there's the brain communicating to the ovaries and all of those things um, and so there is some inconsistency. The range of normal is that if you take longer than 45 days to have your next period, then that could be a little bit too long. And then if you're bleeding more often than every 21 days or bleeding longer than seven days, then that's something that requires evaluation. And that's just because when you get to bleeding too often or too heavy or too long, that increases your risk of anemia or issues there. Can drinking a lot of water and working out shorten your period? I'll let you take that one since you were doing all the periods. No. <laughs> the, <laughs> the reason it doesn't is because the length of your period is typically predicted by how thick that lining has gotten over those days. That already happened. That happened 14 days earlier, you know, when, you, when that lining was growing. So your period, the length of your period has been predicted. You can chug water all day long the day of the start of your period, but that length of that period has already been determined. Working out, same thing. It can help with your cramping, but it's not going to shorten the amount of bleeding and shedding that has to occur because that's completely dependent on how thick that lining became. That's a good question. So in school, how can you have sanitary napkins with you without making it too obvious that you have your period without bringing a purse to the bathroom? Um, first, I want to acknowledge, I think a part of the reason why we ask that question is because there's a lot of what we call period shame or the idea that like, this doesn't happen, even though it's happening to almost half of the population that like, I even, I had a brother growing up and he was just like, oh, it's period. Like, like whenever he just saw a pad wrapper, he would freak out even though I'm like, it's plastic, it's plastic. So I just want to first normalize that we need these products to be able to make sure that we're caring for ourselves and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, some of the things that I would try to do is I, sometimes I would use like a, almost kind of like a pencil case and use that mm -hmm. instead of like a purse. And just because it made it not, Nobody may not be able to recognize exactly what that was. Otherwise, sometimes still I might slowly sneak a pad and a tampon into my pocket and might just hold that in there for the day and then replace it in the bathroom when I need the next one. Um, but I think also just we should really, really evaluate. I hope that culture gets to a place where we understand that these things are healthy and normal. And that as we talked about, everybody should know about it. And even I love when partners and boyfriends and stuff like that or husbands later in the life are actually buying these products for us because it's a part of taking care of the people that you love. Yes, that's lovely. What are some things that can throw off your pH balance? Of the many things that Dr. Fenton mentioned, and when she said to avoid these, those are the things, inserting things into the vagina. The pH balance occurs because of the normal bacteria that she said is in the vagina. And so really anything, almost anything has a pH to it. It's going to be acidic or basic in some sort of way, or it's going to affect the bacteria in the vagina in some sort of way. Um, and so the idea is inserting things into the vagina certainly throw off your pH balance. Other things that can have an effect would be antibiotics. If the pH is actually, you know, determined by or maintained by bacteria, then taking antibiotics, even if it's for a good reason, an ear infection, another infection elsewhere in your body, um, that can also affect your pH. So those are the main things I can think of, unless Dr. Fenton has some other ones. Yeah, no, I would say the only other thing would be all of those cleaning supplies that we talked about yeah. um, that like can be really drying for that area and also potentially like they talk about getting rid of bacteria. And again, that's we don't actually want that to happen. And so I've had patients who were like, I was using these wipes because they liked how they smelled and then they come in with infections because of having that pH balance. Right. 
All right, um, how much blood is too much? So I wanted to go back to what Dr. Terrace talked about earlier, that if you are um, changing pads or tampons for every hour for more than a couple of hours, that helps us think that maybe this is too much blood. Or if you're bleeding for longer than seven days, then we worry that that's too much blood. And either of those mean that like potentially as we talk about anemia, that basically just means the red blood cells that are in your body that are delivering oxygen to all of your tissues and making sure that you can move and do everything that you're supposed to do, that you're losing too much of that and that your body's not able to keep up. And so that's when we start to also think about, should we do something to help make periods either shorter or have you not have bleeding at all to be able to allow that anemia to recover? Absolutely. Um, well, somebody's period ever stop or does it keep going? So yeah, your period actually does stop. The idea is that on average, you'll have a period starting at about 12 and a half. And then the average age of you to stop having period is about 51. Um, and so that time period, and Dr. Fenton kind of touched on this as menopause, that's just when we're done with our reproductive years, those hormones are not kind of rising and falling to release that egg and, and initiate and, and, and kind of set up a potential for pregnancy each month. And so that's when periods are supposed to stop. It's a great question, Dior, about yeast infections. Essentially, similarly, they're not what we consider a sexually transmitted infection. So it's not that you got it from somebody else, but it essentially is that yeast is also normal, but we don't want it to like overgrow. And so sometimes if our cleaning practices are, would say like too good, um, that we're doing more than our body actually needs. Again, we're kind of messing up the balance of bacteria and having yeast um, take over. And so that can be something that's really feels burning, it can feel itchy, and then we kind of describe it being like this thicker white discharge that people may notice. And so if you're having any of those symptoms or all of those, then I would worry that that's a yeast infection. Um, there are a lot of medications over the counter, what we call in the store for yeast infections, but I would say certainly if you've never had one before, before you go buy those off the counter, go talk with a doctor and have them take a look to be able to see if that truly is a yeast infection. So we can do tests to be able to determine that and also give you the appropriate treatment. Um, but how to prevent that is avoiding all of the unnecessary cleaning that we talked about. Um, um, and also making sure that you're not always wearing like tight clothing stuff where bacteria can grow inappropriately. Um, I love this next one. Is the pineapple cranberry juice myth real? You want to take it? Sure. Uh, so the cranberry juice one is related to the prevention of urinary tract infections. And there is actually a property in cranberries and like more natural cranberry supplements that helps to mitigate the ways in which bacteria ascend into the, the uh, urinary tract. And so there is a basis to that, but it's not actually cranberry juice. It's typically like actual cranberry supplements. So rarely are we actually taking that. The pineapple thing actually more so relates to like flavoring and smell. And that is impossible to study. I just, I love to just convey that. I can't do that study. We cannot do that research. It is not medically supported. And that's what I will say about that. All right. So how would you uh, suggest to keep fresh throughout the day with the release of discharge, especially when it gets on your underwear? And so I first just want to say that discharge getting on your underwear is normal, but yeah. that's happening to everybody throughout the day. It's just that this is only the time that we're talking about it, which is why hopefully we're all getting the message that is a totally normal thing. Um, I think the key things that would at least prevent discharge from developing more is actually I've had patients sometimes wear panty liners to try to prevent discharge, or even sometimes if they really don't like it, I've had patients put, use tampons. Both of those things are actually bad ideas. Those can actually increase the amount of discharge that you're having rather than making it less. So just wearing your cotton underwear, no, not wiping with anything other than tissue, not using wipes, because again, that can also be drying and actually cause your body to make more discharge. <laughs> uh, that's great. I totally agree. Uh, next question. Is it normal to bleed after your period ends? And so the idea is intermenstrual bleeding or bleeding that occurs in between periods is not normal. There's a number of causes that can lead to bleeding in between your periods that aren't like crazy emergencies or infections and things, but it's not really normal to have bleeding outside of your period. Having said that, some people will notice that they'll have like, you know, okay, day one through three, those are heavier. Day four and five kind of tip off. Day six is nothing. And then day seven, it's like, hi, I'm back, right? And that's not necessarily bleeding after your period ends. It's more of that your period was always going to be seven days and six days was just exceptionally light as additional blood was making its way down that reproductive tract to actually manifest on whatever product you're using. And so it's not that you're having surprise bleeding after your period. That's just your, your period and kind of a, a waxing and waning a little bit of the flow. If you have bleeding for seven days and then 12 days later, you have surprise bleeding. That's not considered to be normal. And there can be a number of reasons that that occurs, but I would talk to a doctor about it because the, the list is very long. 
So our next question is how to prevent from having periods. First, I just want to say I totally understand that periods can be frustrating sometimes. They can be annoying sometimes. Our hope is to highlight what are the kinds of annoying, frustrating, like really bad pain that's keeping us out of school mm -hmm. or really bleeding that's keeping us out of activities. Those are the things that we shouldn't have to deal with. But mm -hmm. having the bleeding occur itself can be a normal thing and being able to like accept that. So I actually do worry when if you're not on any kind of medication, if you're not having periods, the estrogen that should be in your body and be causing periods is also the one that's strengthening your bones while you're still growing. And so I actually get concerned as a doctor when somebody is mm -hmm. like, I don't, you know, I'm 16 years old, I don't have periods. With that said, Birth control, as we've talked about, can be used as medications. And one of the things that it actually can do for some people is um, skip periods altogether. So if that's something that you are interested in, that that is certainly an option to be able to have. But otherwise, actually having periods when you're not on medications is actually a sign of health. Like some of the doctors are calling it a vital sign in the same way that we check your temperature or blood pressure. Absolutely. Uh, even though we shouldn't wear past tampons when we sleep, how can we prevent bleeding on our clothes and sheets? So you shouldn't wear tampons when you sleep. And that's not an absolute. Like if you're going to take a short nap and you can reliably wake up, that's fine. But if you're a teenager that's going to sleep on the weekend from, you know, midnight until noon, that's too long. I just need you to be able to change your tampon every four to six hours. So the actual act of sleeping in it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's sleeping in it for too long and not being able to alert yourself to remove it so that we're decreasing our risk of toxic shock and those sorts of things. Wearing pads to sleep, all of that is perfectly fine. Other ways to prevent bleeding on the sheets and things. Sometimes if you want to, you know, have the period underwear on, sometimes they have it in boy shorts, you know, things like that. Wearing those pads that have wings, positioning yourself in that way can be helpful. But you can wear either of those products to sleep. It's just better to avoid tampons if you're going to sleep for a prolonged period of time because you don't want those in for longer than six hours. Why does the asparagus smell come out in your urine? That is a great question. Carrots also can have a similar effect where your urine can look a different color. So just certain vegetables yeah. have what are normal chemicals in them that can change the quality of your urine. And so, um, yeah, we don't worry about them because they're temporary and they go away, but they're kind of funny to laugh at. It is. Would you recommend not using or using certain kinds of feminine washes like Summer's Eve or Vagisil? I, I agree with Dr. Rebecca. I recommend none of them because I recommend things that are medically, you know, supported. And none of these are medically supported. They're a business and they know that a lot of folks are going to believe that something's wrong with them, even if there isn't anything wrong with them. And they get paid either way. So we don't recommend it. And I totally agree with Dr. Fenton. All right. Is it OK for your period blood to be brown? I'm glad somebody asked this because I was thinking about this as well, especially when you were talking about kind of that slow trickle of blood. So brown mm -hmm. blood essentially just means that it took less time to come down. And so whether or not your period starts slow or it ends slow, often you might notice brown at either the beginning of your period or at the end. And so anywhere from the red to brown spectrum is totally right. normal. What if I'm 12 and still haven't gotten my period? What about up, down, up, down? I don't know what that last part means, but um, uh, if you're 12 and you haven't gotten your period, remember the average age of getting your period is 12 and a half. So you're still well within you know, the realm of normal. My concern would be if you had breast development you know, at the age of nine or something. It's been more than two years since you started to have breast development, like Dr. Fenton mentioned, because typically you're going to have a period around two years after that. Or if that persists and then you're 16, you haven't had a period. Sometimes it's helpful to ask sisters or your mom when they started their period, and that can give you an idea of what your family kind of looks like. But it doesn't mean you're all going to be the same where you all start at the age of 13 or so. But I wouldn't get super excited or super concerned about being 12 and not start our, starting my period unless I had breast development more than two years earlier. And then you just should talk to your pediatrician or a doctor. So can you have period symptoms when you're not bleeding? I do want to start with saying that like we talked about cramping before, sometimes the cramps and these sometimes the moody symptoms can happen before the period starts. So that itself is normal. We generally don't think of kind of the other symptoms, for example, in the middle of the cycle. So you shouldn't necessarily be having cramping in the middle of your cycle, weeks before you start bleeding, you shouldn't necessarily be having headaches or nausea or moodiness. Those would all be things that would make me worry, but having them start a little bit, a few days before bleeding can be normal. Totally agree. 
<laughs> Talking about the proper way to put in a tampon. I wish I had a tampon with me today. I don't have one. I previously had one. Um, but I might actually be able to grab one out of my purse, but you can start talking. I'm just going to go through. Okay. So Dr. Finnan is going to be amazing and actually look for the prop. But when we talk about the way to insert a tampon, um, the most important thing is to have pick the right size. And so if this is your first time using a tampon, I would pick the smallest size just so that you're starting and you're comfortable. I would not try to put in a tampon if you're not on your period. It would be super uncomfortable. The vagina can be super dry. When you have your period and there's a little bit of flow, it makes it a little bit more lubricated and that's easier to insert. When you're actually um, trying to insert the tampon, this is amazing. Um, you'll see that there's a tip of the tampon and then there should be a grippy portion where you actually hold it with your finger. You want to insert from tip to grip and you actually need to you can stand over something to identify where the vagina is but you want to kind of tilt it backwards kind of towards your the lower part of your spine and what that means is you don't need to go straight up it's more of a tilt back just slightly and you'll kind of feel and follow the path of the vagina and the recommendation is also if you need to feel actually with a finger beforehand just to see exactly the direction you're going that's fine too and so I'm, now I'm going to pause because then Dr. Finn has an actual tampon we can show you because yeah. the we can see colors a little bit, but basically this is a pack. It's um, plastic. So you open it. And then as we talked about, we've got the applicator here, our string here. And so basically, as she talked about, we're kind of angling it towards the back. And so whether that's kind of be seating at the toilet or you can do that also with one leg up in the shower if you need to. And then essentially you're inserting until your fingers are going to touch right in the outside of your vagina. And then after that, with your other finger, you're pushing all the way up into it. And so Under. then it's like this. And all you should be able to see from the outside should be that string. That was just for those who are not seeing them, I'm trying to like, my, my light is doing a lot right now. But um, that basically this is, I would say like about a regular size. And so they can be smaller or a little bit larger than this. Um, and so certainly there's times where I've had patients who are worried if they can't put that in, that um, being able to come in, because sometimes there are hymens that are larger that prevents yeah. that. But, but in general, this should not be an issue. And again, yes, using it only while bleeding. Yeah. And then actually afterwards, you're going to put just so we can talk about hygiene. Afterwards, you'll take your applicator. You can put it back in the plastic. And then I throw this in the trash or if there's like those little um, bins in the bathroom, being able to put that in there as well. Perfect. That's exactly it. That's how that's how it's done. Um, how do menstrual cups work? As I mentioned, you can either absorb the blood, like absorb it like a sponge or hold it. And a menstrual cup simply just holds it. It's also inserted into the vagina, but it kind of has like a tulipy shape to it. And the blood just collects in that like tulip sort of shape, which means if you don't have it in the right position, it ain't going to work. So if it's tilted and it, just like any cup, if you have a cup of juice and you turn it to its side, it's not going to work because it's gravity dependent. And so it has to actually be inserted into the vagina. And there's certain ways to insert it, certain ways to fold it um, that work best for you. Some people use a little bit of lubrication, uh, which is just a gel that gives a little bit of slip to insert it. And then you kind of leave it in place and it collects the blood just sitting in the vagina. But when you remove it, it's different than a tampon. It's not absorbed. There's blood sitting there. So you have to be careful upon removal. It also has a little bit of a string or a pulling kind of um, area where you can pull it out too. So that's how it works. Is it true that your period can raise your sexual hormones? Um, I would say, I like, yes, I would say that people have noticed that sometimes they are feeling like they have what we call libido or like their sex drive can mm -hmm. increase during mm -hmm. their period. Is it okay to eat probiotic gummies, like gummies that can help your body? So yes, it's fine to eat probiotic gummies. Um, some people see that this improves their digestive system, their digestive health. There isn't great literature to show that it's going to improve your vaginal health exactly. Um, and there definitely isn't a gummy that's better than the other. So it's not that we're like anti-probiotic gummies, but it depends on what you're trying to treat or what outcome you're trying to see. If it's that you have some itching and burning or bad vaginal discharge and you're trying to fix that as in treat that, they're not meant to be a treatment for anything. And so I would rather you see, you know, a trusted doctor that understands vaginal discharge that can evaluate you than taking probiotic gummies alone. But taking them shouldn't be harmful and shouldn't mess up anything. 
Is it okay to sleep overnight with panty liners if you don't have your period yet? So again, I would recommend uh, not doing that. And that's mainly just because of the fact that the risk of doing that is higher than the possibility that like what happens if I start my period overnight. Right. The reality you know that period. who started their period um, would know. I think the first time you're like, oh my gosh, it feels like I kind of peed myself, but mm -hmm. I know that I didn't. So I think and I um, that that feeling may wake you up that you can just be able to respond to it without worrying about kind of clothes and your sheets um, when that moment happens. But wearing that panty liner every day basically is creating an environment for bacteria to grow. And again, that can right. cause extra discharge or to have um, balances in your discharge that are bad and need some treatment. And so I would not recommend using panty liners until you <laughs> are on the period and are having really light bleeding days. Totally agree. <laughs> How to stay fresh down there when you work out a lot? So this is not a bad question. Uh, when you work out a lot, that means you need to increase the time, the likelihood and, and timing of cleaning. So if you take a shower, you know that you're just, I'm a sweater. I sweat so much. My hair sweats out. Like I'm just pouring sweat. It's really quite gross. Um, so if I know that I take a shower right after I work out. And sometimes you're in school, depending on what your school situation is and when your PE class is or athletics, you don't have always have the time to take a shower or so. If you even have those kind of body white that clean your body or something that you can have just to kind of wipe down areas, especially the face, cleaning the face, because that can lead to breakouts on your face, kind of where that sweat is. The same thing can happen in the growing area. You know, wherever there's hair follicles and some moisture, you can have build up of bacteria into those hair follicles, folliculitis, things like that, especially if you're removing hair from below. And so I, I want to, the recommendation would be shower more frequently, do your best to clean that area. And if you can just change your underwear, that's helpful too. If that's the only thing you're able to do, that can be helpful. But the idea is if you're going to have a little bit more sweat perspiration that increases the risk of bacteria and that presence of bacteria and getting that bacteria off and cleaning it is the best thing for you to do. And then have you heard about the apple cider vinegar baths for the vulva? Of course. I, I mean, people, okay. people do everything with apple cider vinegar. Lord, why? No, they don't work. <laughs> that's the that's the takeaway. So can water thin out the thickness of the lining? I think what they're asking is, does drinking mm -hmm. water change the maybe the um, lining of the uterus? Mm -hmm. And so again, we talked about, no, there's nothing that you do that changes those variations. That's yeah. just your body. Um, so we no, recommend no. drinking water to be hydrated, but it's not going yeah. to affect your period. That, that's your hormone, right? And so if your water's not going to change your hormonal level necessarily, and so that's why it's not going to change it. But when we know how these things happen, that's how we know, is this myth? Is this medicine? Is this the truth? What's the difference between pads and panty liners? Really, one is thicker, one is thinner. That's it. It's not really that special. It's like a panty liner is thinner pad. The function, the way you do it, the way you place it, it's all the same. Wow, that was an amazing session. Thank you so Thank much, you, Dr. Brilliant. Rebecca and Dr. Sharis. I know that I learned so much myself. Also, make sure to follow Dr. Sharis at The Period Doctor. And Dr. Rebecca, could you just remind everyone of your Twitter one more time? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter as rfentonmd. Awesome. Everyone, make sure to check them out so that way you guys can stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you guys so much. This was a blast. Thank you for having us. This has been Thank so much you. fun.